Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes, I can. Yep. Yeah, hey. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, so thank you for joining. I am so excited. Um, I believe the last time that I've seen you was um, back last year in August, I think, at the, the Frank Lemire uh, Presidential Forum. So um, definitely thank you for the pizza. It was really good. So um, <laughs> Um, if people are joining in right now, uh, my name is Trish and I'm from the Great Plains Action Society team. Um, I'm here with Mark Charles, who is a dual citizen of the Navajo Nation in the United States, who is also running for the presidency. Um, that's very exciting because you're an indigenous man running for the presidency. So um, this is the first interview in a series of interviews, um, which will be featured on the Great Plains Action Society website. You can find that under, under the Riverland Native Voter Project. Um, so please go check it out. Um, and then also, Mark, thank you for being here. Um, tell us a little about yourself and your background. Well, thank you. Let me introduce myself briefly. So Yate, Mark Charles Yanishia. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people with our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American, and that's why I say loosely translated, that means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my mother's father, is also and then my fourth clan, um, my father's father is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. And I just want to acknowledge before we, we begin this interview that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Piscataway. Uh, today it's known as Washington, D.C., but it's the Piscataway. They were the nation that lived here. They hunted here. They fished here. Their societies were here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And I like to acknowledge the people whose land I'm on no matter where I go across the country. And so I want to honor the Piscataway as the indigenous host of this land and thank them for the stewardship they've had of these lands for hundreds, even thousands of years. So, uh, yes, it's, it's good to be with you. And I, uh, I moved, I'm, I'm from the Southwest. I grew up in a border town to the Navajo Nation and uh, lived in a small town called Gallup, New Mexico. I attended college at UCLA, where I got my uh, bachelor's degree in history. And then I moved around for a number of years. I was in um, Albuquerque for a few years, and then San Francisco for a few years, Los Angeles for a few years, uh, moved back to Gallup, got married when I was in LA. My wife and I moved to Gallup, and uh, our, our oldest son was born when we lived in Gallup. And then I, we moved to Denver, Colorado, where I pastored a church called the Christian Indian Center. And that's where I began getting more engaged with kind of native culture and understanding some of the history of the, between the church and indigenous peoples, not just here in the U.S., but even globally around, around the world. And really began engaging in dialogue with indigenous leaders from all over the world about what, what was this history and how do we begin to overcome it. That prompted me to move back to the Navajo Nation, where I lived with my family for 11 years. Three of those years, we were in a very remote section of our reservation. Um, we were six miles off the nearest paved road on a dirt road, no running water, no electricity. Right now, there's all this talk about, um, you know, the, the pandemic and the way it's hitting our Navajo people. Uh, we now have the highest rate of uh, COVID-19 virus infections of any. If we were a state, we'd have the highest rate of any of, any of the 50 states in the country. Um, and there's a lot of headlines being made about you know, a third of our Navajo people don't have running water or electricity in their homes. Um, and so our family lived in a, in a community that was, that was like that for three years. And then we moved from there to Fort Defiant, which is right near Winter Rock. And we were, uh, we were in that location for about eight years until, and then five years ago, we moved from the Navajo Nation here to D.C., uh, it was while living on, the, on our reservation where I began learning about and studying and being engaged in uh, the doctrine of discovery. What, what did this mean for our history? What did it mean for our native peoples? How has it affected our country today? Uh, I, I was, became familiar with the research of a lot of other um, 
of people working on this. Uh, Stephen Newcomb wrote a book on the doctrine of discovery titled Pagans in the Promised Land. There's other many other native leaders and people who have been working on trying to bring this issue to the forefront. And I published my first book on this with a co-author, uh, a good friend of mine, Sung Chan Ra, just a few months ago, uh, last November, titled Unsettling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. So yeah, so now we're in DC and I uh, decided um, out of the study of the Doctrine of Discovery that I really wanted to help our nation deal with its history. And so last May, a, a year ago, I announced my campaign for President of the United States. Oh, and sorry, the theme I have of my, my campaign. Here. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Here. And the theme of my campaign sorry. <laughs> is that I want to, not, not a problem at all, not a problem. So the theme of my campaign is I want to build a nation where really for the very first time, we the people truly means all the people. I want to help our country deal with the foundations that for even to this day are exclusion. They exclude women, they exclude natives, they exclude African Americans, um, and they've become the foundations of a very unjust colonial system of government that ha has deep impact on the way our marginalized communities live today. Right. Um, so with that, um, I, I, Obviously, um, with the pandemic and everything, I've heard that there are rising rising rates of the COVID-19 in the Navajo Nation. So um, I was just wondering how you felt about it. Have you done anything to help? Um, how can people help? And then um, this leads to obviously um, to healthcare and IHS. Um, and then do, do you have any policies or plans to address these issues? And what are your policies as far as IHS and healthcare? Yeah, so uh, one of the, there's a lot of challenges as to why COVID-19 is, is uh, spreading so rampantly on our Navajo Nation and why it's become such a crisis. <laughs> and that crisis is really one that's 250 years in the making. You know, it, uh, unfortunately, because we have this long history of colonialism, stolen lands, broken treaties, um, there really is no short-term solution to what's going on today. This is the fruit of not dealing with what's been going on for the past 250 years. And so I, I sympathize greatly with President Nez and the whole Navajo Nation government that is trying hard to, um, to uh, handle this crisis among our people. And yet there are so few tools that we have at our disposal. You know, one of the challenges that we face and why it's been so difficult to get our Navajo people to really take social distancing seriously is because of our clan system, I think, you know, where, where the majority of your relationships on the Navajo Nation amongst who you relate with on a daily basis are people you're related to. They're your clans, they're your relatives, your aunts, your uncles, your, your grandparents, your, um, your whole clan system, which is very extensive. And so because of of the social distancing and and the way that it's it's so you know it's causing calling people to separate themselves even in in cities among non-native peoples as i've observed people whether talking to them on the phone or hearing stories even just your average american will tend to let their guard down a little bit more in regards to family so there may be aunts and uncles or cousins or brothers and sisters that live in a different house across town or another city, and people will be more likely to go over and visit them and break social distancing with them than they would with their neighbor across the street, again, because they don't know them. And so when the bulk of your relationships on the reservation are people you are related to, it again, it doesn't feel like you're disobeying the rules that much because you're family, you're, you're related and you, you kind of know where everybody's at and you trust that the people are healthy and so on and so forth. Second, uh, the other reason I think it's such a big problem to get our, our people to social distance, and I lived there for 11 years, you know, we lived, we lived there during the Great Recession in the early 2000s. And when we were there, we didn't even talk about the Great Recession. That wasn't even a part of our conversation because we had astronomically high unemployment rates in a good year. So having 
an unemployment of 8 to 10 percent, which is what the nation was struggling with around that time, that would have been a dream for us. And so there's this, this sense, because you feel so isolated um, and you feel so separate, you feel so marginalized from the rest of the country, that you tend to get this mindset where what you see on the news, what you see what's happening out in the world, that's out in the world and it's not necessarily a part of your environment because you are so, you are so marginalized and isolated anyway on the reservation. And oftentimes the situation you're dealing with there is worse than what the rest of the world or the rest of the nation is dealing with. And so there's this sense of like, well, that's happening out there. It's not happening here. There's this false sense of we're somehow separate from that. And so, again, that makes it hard to take social distancing seriously when you're used to 99% of the time being almost completely disconnected from what's going on outside of the reservation. Um, and so, and then third, just culturally, you know, the way that you introduce yourself, the way that you greet people, the way that you interact with, especially your relatives, it involves shaking hands, it involves, you know, greeting people, it involves, I mean, this is the, this is the way you respect and honor people. And so it, it's severely breaking with our cultural traditions and the way that we just relate to one another when we introduce ourselves, when we meet people. Um, and and so all of these factors, I think, have made it very challenging for our people to take social distancing very seriously. Um, and, you know, the, the Navajo Nation, our government, has been working very hard. I, I see their, their tweets. I, I follow their, their press releases. I follow what they put up on the website and what they put out in the Navajo Times, pleading with our people to, to take social distancing seriously. But it's such a challenge. And then the, the fourth one which is the fact that because, again, it's 26,000 square miles, our reservation, about 180, 200,000 people. So very large, very remote, but there's only 12 to 13 full service grocery stores. It's a food desert. So this makes your border towns incredibly important. Flagstaff, Arizona, Page, Arizona, Farmington, New Mexico, and Gallup, New Mexico are four of the major border towns. And these border towns could not exist without the business from the Navajo people going off our reservation and shopping and trading and, and pur making purchases within, within these border towns. And um, so one of the things that, that happened is on the weekends, and I'll talk specifically about Gallup, where you literally have between 40 and 60,000 people from the reservation going into Gallup on the weekends to buy groceries, to get supplies for the week, to haul water, to buy feed for your animals. Um, you know, because there's so few grocery stores, you have to go to the border towns on the weekends um, in order to stock up again. And the first weekend of the month is by far the busiest and the most important because so many people are on fixed incomes. They get a government check or something on, on the first day of the month. And so your last week of the month, you're really stretching your money to get your groceries to last through the end of the month. And so the first of the month, you have to go into town. And so this is what made what, what Gallup did specifically about three or four weeks ago so challenging at the beginning of the month of May, where the, the mayor of Gallup sent a letter to the governor of New Mexico because the Navajo Nation was being hit so hard by COVID-19 and social distancing wasn't being practiced well, and so there was a, a large spread, and Gallup, McKinley County, where Gallup is located, was now the highest county in New Mexico with COVID-19 infections, and they were coming up on the first of the month. I think the mayor saw that, and he kind of panicked, and he sent a letter to the governor of New Mexico asking her to enact what's called the Riot Control Act, which would allow the governor to basically seal off the roads coming into the city. And so that's exactly what the governor did. This is the Democratic governor. She invoked the Riot Control Act, sent police and National Guard to all of the roads coming into the city of Gallup, and basically prevented the native peoples, the Zuni people from the south and the Navajo people from the north from coming into the city on that first weekend of the month. And it was 
there was no good solution to what was happening. But as far as bad solutions, from my observation, this was about the worst solution you could possibly come up with. They could have had people, even, even police and, and other National Guards at the grocery stores and at the stores to make sure social distancing was being maintained. They could have done any number of things, but to put literally National Guard at the, at the roadways coming into town to prevent the native people from even going grocery shopping under the jurisdiction of the Riot Control Act. I mean, that's about as dehumanizing and as, as um, insulting as you could possibly make it. Absolutely. And so my campaign actually released a statement after that happened that weekend, decrying that and condemning that and, and saying this, this is not the right way to handle this situation. Yes, this is a bad situation. There's no perfect solution to it. It's 250 years in the making, but this was probably the worst solution the government could have come up with. And it probably did the most as far as walking back any, any sense of, of, of um, progress we've made in just understanding our native peoples as peers and citizens and even humans, which again, our constitution still doesn't fully recognize the humanity of native peoples, women or African people, African Americans. Absolutely. I think that um, triggers a lot of intergenerational trauma as well as the historical trauma. And here we are still having to deal with these things. Um, I know that the, yeah. um, the Rosebud or no, it was, um, Tribal chairman um, Harold Frazier is trying to protect his his people, and now you know you have the South Dakota Governor Nome, um, who's trying to basically say, "No, you can't do this. This is illegal." So um, I just I can't yeah. imagine. Um, you know, it's it's really about Indigenous people being there for Indigenous people. Um, it's it's always been that way. So. And this really shows the double standard where in New Mexico, they sent in the National Guard to prevent people from going into a non-native city. And in South Dakota, they were condemning the tribes from trying to protect their people right. um, by, by not even blocking the roads, but by monitoring and making sure where people were going and so on and so forth. And so what this comes down to is at the end of the day, our native nations do not have sovereignty over the lands that we are living on. Yes. And this is one of the biggest challenges we face as a nation, as, as native nations, and even as the U.S. government deals with, with native nations, is the whole understanding of who has sovereignty over native lands. And one of the metaphors or analogies I use all the time is I tell people whenever the issue of tribal sovereignty comes up, I say, yeah, tribal sovereignty is kind of a misnomer. We are sovereign over our lands the same way your teenage child is sovereign over their bedroom. Sure. Yes, they can put a sign on the door. Yes, they can, you know, they can stay, keep out. But at the end of the day, it's not, it may be their bedroom, but it's not their house. Yeah. And so the parent will come in and make that very known, especially if they feel something's getting out of hand or they just don't like the, the child exercising that level of independence. And that's really what's going on with our native nations. And that's where we have to wrestle with this as a nation um, is sovereignty over tribal lands, which goes back to dealing with the treaties and that goes back to dealing with the doctrine of discovery. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, so the next topic is um, we have released a clip where Trans Canada Energy is shown transporting pipes via railroad tracks. Um, this is a clear message that they intend on constructing the KXL um, with no halting. Um, what is your stance on the KXL? And then what would you what are you planning to do if elected as the next president when it comes to big oil, big egg, and corporates who profit off of these um, these massive projects. Yes. Yeah, so again, this, I would take this back, especially in regards to the pipelines in regards to tribal sovereignty, where I, I read an article just the other day that um, Vice President Biden um, said that he would, he would cancel that action and prevent that pipeline from being built. Um, 
and which is, you know, is President Trump who basically allowed it to be built. And the, the problem is, is because, because of the doctrine of discovery and because the way that's worked through our legal system, you know, I, I gave a TEDx talk um, and I also wrestle with this very sharply in our book, but I gave a TEDx talk about a year and a half ago titled, We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And I laid out really in detail the most recent case referencing the doctrine of discovery, which is the United Indian Nation versus the city of Cheryl of New York in 2005. And in this case, the, the United Indian Nation was trying to reestablish sovereignty over some of their traditional land that they purchased in the 1990s um, in the state of New York. And the city of Cheryl was trying to uh, keep their sovereignty over those lands, which the, the lands they bought were within the city limits. And so um, they, they went to court against the United Indian Nation. The lower courts ruled in favor of the United People, and the Supreme Court reversed that decision. And in their first footnote of the case, they referenced the doctrine of discovery. I won't go into the whole case, but it, I, I go through it in, in fairly good detail, showing and even comparing it to the 1823 Supreme Court case, which is the first one referencing the doctrine of discovery, basically using the language of natives are savages and, and we can't let them have their own land. And the court in 2005 makes the same argument using slightly different language, but makes the same argument and ultimately concludes, again, based on the doctrine of discovery and these arguments that the United Indian Nation cannot rekindle sovereignty over these lands. One of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions I've read in my lifetime and it was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Again, this is the challenge of our nation is when it comes down to issues like land titles, and because land titles are based on a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery, this literally makes white supremacy a bipartisan value. And so the challenge we have as native peoples is the institution of, of the government, it doesn't matter if it's right or left, Republican or Democrat, the nation is deeply invested in maintaining these racist and white supremacist systems, which preclude us from having sovereignty over our lands. And so really you're kind of left to the whim of whoever might be in office. And so President Trump said, well, we would, we would allow this to go through by certain binds. So well, if I get elected, I'll prevent it from going through. But again, this, this still leaves the native people, our native nations as mere occupants in lands that we have no control over. And so, the easy answer would be to say, well, I would just, I would do the same thing Vice President Biden would do. I would just, you know, cancel this contract or whatever it was needed to do legally to stop that pipeline from going through. But that, that's a short-term solution. It doesn't fix the root of the problem. The root of the problem is our nation feels that it can break treaties with native nations and we can suffer whatever happened, but the country doesn't give any land back. So the challenge is when you break a treaty, then neither party is bound by the treaty anymore. When President Trump broke treaty with Iran and did not honor the nuclear treaty that President Obama negotiated, then Iran was no longer obligated to allow inspectors in and everything else. They both were able to be free from that treaty. When the U.S. breaks treaty with native nations, we don't get our land back. And so this is the challenge is that the, the U.S. government can feel like it can break treaty with native peoples and the only ones who pay the consequence for that are native nations. Doesn't cost the U.S. government anything. So they can do it on a whim. Oh, well, honor this treaty or I won't honor this treaty. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to cost us anything. And so we need to somehow create a precedent that, no, these treaties are binding. And yes, you're allowed to break them. But that means then the control of the land goes back to the native nations. If you're going to break the treaty, you no longer get to keep the land. 
Absolutely. That the treaty allowed you to, to build on or to settle or to whatever else happened. And so this is the root of the problem. And this is, the, you know, the Constitution states that treaties are the supreme law of the land. If the U.S. government understood that their existence in these lands were based legally only on treaty, they would take negotiations and relationships with Native nations a whole lot more seriously. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is one of the things that as president of the United States, because the Constitution states treaties are the supreme law of the land, I want to do whatever I can to make sure that not only will I as the president honor these treaties, but that anyone who follows after me will be legally obligated to honor these treaties or else to return the land that the treaties allow them to have access to. Right on. And so this is the long-term solution that we need, and nobody is willing to have this solution. Even if I, I published an article a few weeks ago, you know, one of the issues that's come up is the Wampanoag um, Reservation, which was established during President Obama's term in office. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was in March, the, the um, Trump administration disestablished that reservation. And there was a large outcry because they were, they were disestablishing a reservation of a native nation, but they were doing it also in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah. I would compare that to a landlord telling a renter that they were evicted from their apartment literally while a hurricane was, was crashing through the city. I mean, if, if there's ever a worse time to evict someone from their apartment, it's during a hurricane or during a tornado or during some other national crisis like that, or, or natural crisis like that. What's interesting is Vice President Biden released a statement decrying the injustice of the, of the Trump administration and pointing to the fact that as President Obama's VP, he helped establish these this reservation and then he said something to the effect that one of the most important responsibilities of the u.s government in restoring relation with native nations is to take their lands into trust and as i thought about that i'm like how does that make any sense whatsoever how do you restore a nation-to-nation -nation relationship by taking someone's land into trust we would never say that to france or britain Britain, we would like to restore our nation-to-nation -nation relationship with you by taking your land into trust. No, see, the whole fact that the U.S. government takes native lands into trust is based on the doctrine of discovery that was used by the Supreme Court to state that natives are only occupants of the land. We're not fully human. We don't have title to it. White Americans, European Americans have the fee title, the right of discovery to the land, so they're the true title holders. This is why the government takes native lands into trust, because legally we are defined as savages and we are not given rights to the land. And so for President, Vice President Biden to say as president, he would see his most solemn duty in regards to Native nations is to hold our land into trust, is essentially saying I would be, he's basically saying I would be a better landlord than President Trump would be, but I will still be your landlord. You still will not have sovereignty over your land. You still will be legally defined as savages, I'll just be a little nicer in how I execute that. Right. And so this is, again, where I'm saying neither side is willing to really deal with the problem and offer a long-term sustainable solution, which is to treat Native nations as people, as fully human, and as people who had sovereignty over our lands, as well as have treaty relationship with the United States of America. Absolutely. I definitely agree with that. Um, with the more recent developments in the race of the U.S. presidency, were you surprised when Bernie decided to suspend his campaign? And did he reach out to you? Does this change anything for your campaign currently? Um, he did not reach out to me, no. Um, on one hand, it, it did not surprise me. 
I actually did a live stream uh, the week, the day after he dropped out of the, or he suspended his campaign. He didn't drop out. He suspended his campaign. And I, I spoke directly to Bernie Sanders supporters um, who now many of them were feeling very kind of abandoned um, by, by Senator Sanders. And one of the things you have to remember about Senator Sanders, um, and the same thing is very true with Donald Trump, Senator Sanders is not a Democrat. He's an independent. He got elected into the Senate as an independent. He went down to the, his other offices as independent. When he decided to run in 2016, he realized that if he ran as an independent, he would not get, make near the amount of money in donations. He would not be in the debates. And he wanted to amplify his voice in that way. So even though he was not an, a Democrat, and even though anyone who knew anything about politics knew that 2016 was Hillary Clinton's year, he still ran as a Democrat. Not surprisingly, the Democratic Party said, no, we're not going to let you win this race. And so they, they did what they did to make sure that he was not able to, to be victorious in that, um, in that primary. And it created a lot of bitter feelings. And he ended up not even endorsing Hillary Clinton until very late in the game and, and probably caused a lot of disunity within the Democratic Party. And then in 2018, he had to run for Senate again. And he ran for Senate as an independent. And he got reelected to the Senate as an independent. And then in 2020, he ran again as a Democrat for president. So just, you have to understand, and I was watching this, and I, I, I knew the Democratic Party, I mean, the Democratic Party had watched in 2016 Donald Trump, who again is not a Republican. Donald Trump's not a Republican. He co-opted the Republican Party, but he's not a true Republican. He's not, he's not fiscally conservative. He's not morally conservative. He's not a Republican. And yet he co-opted the, the Republican Party and actually won their primary and became their president. And the Democrats saw that and they were like, we, he may have done that over there. We are not going to let that happen to our party. And so they prevented Bernie Sanders from doing it in 2016 and they prevented him from doing it again in 2020. And so I, 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 while I was a bit disappointed, I, I, I liked Bernie Sanders as a candidate. Um, I thought he was bringing some important dialogue into the Democratic Party. I was not surprised when he suspended his campaign because I was quite certain, and this is one of the reasons I didn't run as a Democrat, because I was, I'm not a true Democrat either, and I was quite certain that they would never nominate someone like me. Um, and so... Yeah, I was I was not surprised when Bernie Sanders suspended his campaign. But what this means now is that there is a large group of progressive voters who many are true independents. They're not Democrats either. And they're feeling now abandoned by Senator Sanders. And they're literally looking for a new home politically, even for a new candidate. And so our campaign has been trying strategically to reach out to Senator Sanders supporters and show them that, yeah, there's a lot of things about the campaign we're running here that are, are similar to what Senator Sanders is running on. I, I, one of the, my critiques of Senator Sanders is I loved his whole, um, his whole work to kind of work against systemic economic inequality. I thought his ideas of, medi of, of universal health care are very important things. I would agree that health care is, is a, a right, it's not a privilege. But I don't think Sanders Sanders brought the issues deep enough down to the, the issues of race. I, I don't think Sanders Sanders truly understands the way race works here in the United States. And because of the fact that to this day, the Constitution excludes women, excludes natives, and excludes African Americans, had he somehow got elected, and had he somehow been able to push universal health care through Congress, because of the way our foundations are written and excluding certain groups and are primarily written for the benefit of white landowning men, we would have had great universal health care for anyone who was a white male. Everyone else 
women, people of color, other marginalized communities would have been given a hodgepodge that would have ebbed and flowed based on who was in office and what was happening. And so one of the things I've, I've been trying to tell Senator Sanders supporters is I completely agree that universal health care is a right, not a privilege. But if we are going to implement something like that, we first have to remove the systemic racism, sexism, and white supremacy from our foundations. Once we can do that, then we can start talking about now that we have a foundational level understanding that we are all equal, now we can begin implementing things like criminal justice reform, like addressing um, the, the exploitation through corporations, and like providing something like universal health care. But if we don't deal with the foundational levels at the, at the beginning, which are very oppressive and very exclusionary, we're never going to get there to have those things for everybody. Definitely agree um, that doctrine of discovery is just um, it has done so much destruction and it's still like it's still a reason for you know systemic oppression to keep going so I definitely agree um, so I could only imagine what it's like to run for the presidency so how has your journey as an indigenous man been challenging how has it been encouraging what have you learned This has been a very challenging process. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I've learned a lot. I've had my eyes opened even wider than they were before I got into this process. One of the things that I've, I have experienced more than I even expect, I was expecting to experience this, but it was even at a higher level than I thought. I have never been in a space where at every level it was defined for white landowning men and really for nobody else. Like everything about the process of running for president is intended to make it easier and better access for people who are white landowning and male than it is for women, people of color, other people from the margins. And I think one of the things that surprised me a little bit was how intentional the media played into this. I, I knew before I got into this that the media would not want to cover, especially issues that I talk about a lot, the doctrine of discovery and native issues and things like this. I thought by running for president, that would kind of force the hand of the media to cover these issues a bit more thoroughly. I knew I would never get the same kind of attention that the Democrats or the Republicans were getting, but I thought the media would, would get, would cover these stories a bit more. Um, and, you know, I'm an independent, I'm, I'm right now the top independent candidate in the race. I've been on the same stage as the other Democratic candidates three separate times. I was at the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum in uh, last August in Iowa. I was at the second Native Forum in Las Vegas in January, and I was at another forum called Vote Common Good in Iowa, um, also in January, I think it was. I've been on the stage with almost every other candidate out there except for Joe Biden, who didn't come to any of those forums, um, but all the other candidates I was on the same stage with. And what shocked me was how intentionally the media either excluded me from the reporting on those events or in some cases flat out wrote me out of the event. Um, and even when we would call the media, mainstream media, and tell them your report was wrong, it did not include, you know, my campaign press team would call them and say, hey, you did not include Mark in this report even though he was there and you reported, you know, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we're not going to include that. And that was very surprising. I, I, I didn't think I, I did not expect the media to be that blatant um, in their 
allegiance to their two parties, you know, whether it's, it's the Democrats or the Republicans. So that surprised me a little bit. I think what, what has encouraged me in this is the number of people who I've met all around the country. And right now it's a small group of people who are more really actively supporting me. But there are a lot of people who are really willing and looking for a way to engage deeper with some of the problems that we're facing. You know, I, last May, in, in May of 2019, we released my campaign announcement video. It was a nine minute video laying out my vision and for building a nation where we the people truly mean to all the people. And to this day, I get emails or comments or I get tagged in posts on social media from people who are like, I've just seen your video for the first time and it's brought me to tears. You know, like you, you were able to hit the nail on the head. And one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about is it's, it's demonstrated to me that there are a large number of people, a growing number of people who are really eager to address our nation's problems at a more systemic level. Um, and that's given me a lot of hope. That's given me a lot of hope. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually looking forward. You know, one of the reasons I ran as an independent is because I knew if I ran as a Democrat, I would raise more money. I would probably be in the debates early on. But I also knew that because the Democratic Party ran their primary, or both parties run their primaries through Iowa and New Hampshire, literally making white landowning men the gatekeepers for the campaigns, that any marginalized person, person of color, woman, member of LGBTQ, would basically be gone by the time the primaries got into full swing. That's one of the, re that's one of the primary reasons I ran as an independent. And that happened. All of the people of color were removed from the debate stage before the first primary. And everyone was removed by what the second or third primary, except for, except for the two white landowning men. Um, and so now it's May of 2020, Cory Booker's gone, Kamala Harris is gone, Julian Castro's gone. Elizabeth Warren's gone, Amy Klobuchar's gone, Pete Buttigieg is gone, but I'm still here. I'm still running. And now that we are much closer to having two nominees, you know, when, when I was after, after the, uh, the Frank Lemire forum, I was one of the few national interviews I've gotten was by Democracy Now! after the, the Frank Lemire forum last August. And uh, the host, Amy Goodman, while she was interviewing me, she mentioned, she used the language about talking about Kamala Harris and said, one of your opponents, Kamala Harris. And I said, well, Kamala Harris is not my opponent. I'm an independent, she's a Democrat. She's running in the Democratic primary and her opponents are the other Democratic candidates. I'm not in that same race. They are sprinting right now towards this Iowa primary and this New Hampshire, or this Iowa caucus, this New Hampshire primary, where their fate will be decided. I'm not under that same timeline. My opponent will be the eventual nominee from both the Democrat and the Republican parties. And so, again, now that we have two fairly certain presumptive nominees for both the Democrats and the Republicans, and they're both white landowning men from the 1%, now, my ability to draw a distinction between myself and them is incredibly simple. With President Trump, we have one of the most divisive candidates our nation has seen in a very, very, very long time. And with Vice President Biden, we have one of the, probably the least inspiring candidate on the entire democratic stage in 2020. Even his own wife admitted 
that my husband may not be as good on issues as your candidate, but at the end of the day, you have to talk about who's going to win mm -hmm. and you need to support my husband. <laughs> what kind of a talk is that? <laughs> you know, and so, it, so we literally have one of the most divisive men we could have found and one of the least inspiring men we could find. And so I found that even though it's a year later, one of my best campaign tools is if I can just get people to watch my campaign video. First of all, it's not divisive. It's very unifying. Yes, it talks about some hard truths. It talks about some difficult history, but it literally calls people to build a nation where everybody is included. And second, it's over the top inspiring. I get messages from people that I, I feel hope after watching your video. And this election, by just how I'm observing it, is probably one, one of the most frustrating, it's even more frustrating for people than 2016 was. And in 2016, you had a large number of people, they weren't voting for Donald Trump, they were voting against Hillary Clinton. And they weren't voting for Hillary Clinton, they were voting against Donald Trump. And that same sort of frustration, I'm seeing it very strongly right now. And so I have a lot of confidence, even though we're not making huge splashes nationally yet, our campaign's definitely growing. We're getting more, more press, we're getting more public um, social media, we're getting more tags and hits on our, on our campaign. Our fundraising is still fairly low, but we're definitely growing as a campaign. And I'm convinced that as we get closer and closer through the summer and even into the fall to this election, and as we get close to November, there are gonna be an overwhelming amount of people just shaking their heads saying, I can't believe these are our only two options. And if in that time they can, they can come across my campaign video, they can hear this very unifying call to build a nation where we the people means all the people. They can see the vision and, it's, and, 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 and experience some of that hope of what is possible. Right on. I, uh, I wanted we could, to- We could oh, get there. Oh, I um No, I'm I'm done. <laughs> um I wanted to I obviously with like Bernie dropping out, it just felt like everyone was in a panic and you were the first candidate. You've always actually been the candidate that I would want to vote for. I am a felon, so I'm still in the process of restoring my right to vote. So, um that's a whole nother issue, but I yeah. thought, you know, like why are people freaking out? Like this candidate mark charles is very similar to bernie and you know it's he's not only that it, you do address the systematic oppression and the the root of it so i just i it kind of floored me um that people just didn't realize you know um so that is exactly why i wanted to have this interview and to uplift your work because i honestly yeah i i watched your movie um watched the clip and um, I just, I get chills every time that I watch it. Cause I'm like, wow, this is, this is a powerful message. And not only that, it's just, you're not about, um, just the message. You're actually about the groundwork too, because like I said, we've met in, um, August at, you know, the presidential forum, but you took the time to actually, um, you know, have this event where natives can come together and we can talk about these issues and we can, you know, you are very personable. So that's why I just, I support your, your work in general. So, um, is there anything else that you would like to share? I obviously, I want you to share your platforms. Um, I believe your website is markcharles2020.com. Uh, but yeah, if yeah. there's anything else that you would like to share, please do. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm, I'm working hard to help people understand is, first of all, a lot of people do not understand what works with independents. And so because I'm an independent, um, at the moment, I don't need anybody's vote. Like, I'm not in a primary. I'm, I don't need 
someone to decide today, I'm going to vote for you. I am working to get on the ballot in all 50 states. And the way you get on the ballot is you collect signatures. Now, because of COVID-19 and because of social distancing and stay at home rules, um, in most states, not only is collecting signatures not possible, it's actually irresponsible. There's three states that allow us to collect signatures remotely. These are the states of Alaska, of North Dakota, and of New Hampshire. And so our campaign has begun the process of remotely collecting signatures. People can go to my website, marktrell2020.com, click on the ballot access link, scroll down to find your state. We have, we've been reaching out to all the secretaries of state throughout of all 50 states in the District of Columbia, finding out what their ballot access criteria are, how have they changed due to COVID-19. We are putting the most recent information that we found up on our website. And for those three states, they can download the petition, they can sign it, and then they can mail it back to us. They don't have to go out in public. They don't have to break social distancing. They don't have to, um, you know, even break a stay at home. And in, and in Alaska and North Dakota, they can actually sign it and then scan it and email it back to us. And then there's a fourth state, which is the state of um, Oklahoma, where they don't have a signature requirement. We just have to pay a fee to get on the ballot there. And in Oklahoma, it's a high fee, it's $35,000. But the good news is, is we don't have to collect that money only in Oklahoma. We can collect that money nationally. And one of the things, you know, I was, I was just looking through this the other day. I'm the second Native American to run for president. Russell Means ran back in the 1980s. And he ran as in, in the Libertarian Party. And he, I think he came in second, so he didn't get the nomination there. So from what I've learned, from what I've seen, there has never been a Native person on the ballot for president in our entire nation's entire history. Now that's shameful, that, 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 that is shameful. And so I, I was, as I was thinking, what would be the best state to get on first? the most symbolic state. And I really think Oklahoma would be it. Not only because of the large number of native nations that have been moved to and live in Oklahoma, but because of the fact that we can actually collect that money nationally. It can be a way for the entire nation to come together and say, we hear this vision and we wanna take the symbolic step of getting this name on the ballot collectively as the first step to move this, this candidate towards the presidency. And so I would be, I mean, I'll be thrilled no matter where I get on the ballot in, but I will be, I think it'll be very symbolic if we can get on the ballot in Oklahoma first and if we can do it by literally collecting the money from representatives from all 50 states. And so I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this process. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, but I, as we're getting, now that the, the, the primaries are winding down and we're getting closer to the conventions and the, the, the presumptive nominees are gonna become the official nominees within the next few months. This is why I ran as independent because this is the conversation I wanna be in. I want to be able to have a dialogue with the Democratic nominee, most likely Joe Biden, the Republican nominee, most likely Donald Trump. And I want to have my voice be in there on the debate stage. And people can put me there. They don't have to vote for me yet. They can, they can still take six more months to decide if they want to vote for me. It will cost them nothing as far as their vote to be able to put me on the ballot. So my voice and so this vision can be a part of the national dialogue. And this is the dialogue I'm doing this for. This is the conversation I want us to have. You know, in, in his last State of the Union, President Obama was addressing the diversity that he faced throughout both of his terms in office. And he was lamenting that. And he was talking about the need for our nation to have a new politics. And he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people 
our constitution begins with these three simple words. Words we've come to recognize mean all the people. Now that sounds beautiful. As I sat in my home listening to him, I wanted to feel inspired, but I had studied too much. I knew too much history. And I looked around at the doctrine of discovery and the history of against native peoples and women and African Americans. I said, when, Mr. President, when did we make this decision? The founding fathers did not believe that we the people meant all the people. Abraham Lincoln, one of the most white supremacists and genocidal presidents in our nation's history, did not believe that we the people meant all the people. As good as the civil rights movement was, it did not get us to the point of we the people, meaning all the people. President Trump does not believe we the people means all the people. The problem is, is we've never decided collectively as a nation that we want our country to be a place where we the people includes everybody. I'm tired of debating the humanity of people from the margins. I'm calling the question. The United States has said for so long, we are a nation that believes in equality and freedom. And I'm saying, if we truly believe that, then we have to change our foundations. We have to change what our Declaration of Independence stands for, what our constitution states, what our legal precedents mean. We can't just pretend or wish or individually say this is true. We have to collectively decide this as a nation. And that is what this campaign is all about. I'm calling the question, do we want to live in a nation where we the people truly means all the people? If not, then guess what? We're doing a great job. But if we do, then we have to work on our foundations. And that is what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm calling our people to. That's the hope I'm trying to offer. That's the vision I have for us. And when you compare me to the most divisive candidate our nation has seen in a long time with Donald Trump, and one of the least inspiring candidates our nation has seen in a long time, I'm hoping, I'm expecting, I'm looking for how this vision is going to rise to the top and actually change the national dialogue about what we want to do as a nation. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for setting this time aside. Um, I will definitely be in contact with you. Um, and yeah, so I will put this up on the great plainsaction.org site um, for the webinar. And then um, there will be other um, other content that I'm going to put out there. So please visit markcharles2020.com and go support Mark Charles. This is a great candidate. So um, with that being said, thank you. Um, everyone have a wonderful night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And have gone that.